turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to read to you verses 1 through 8 in just a moment. But since I've finished recently going through Ephesians, and it'll be another month or so before we get to Philippians, and I wanted to take this opportunity to meditate upon this milestone that God has authored in having me employed, let alone employed for the same church for 30 years. And what I, what God led me to was Paul's final epistle. Particularly, we want to look at 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8, but I entitled it 30 Years and Finishing Well because I don't believe I'm ready yet to retire. I'm getting close, but I desire to finish well, and I believe I still got some fight in me. By the grace of God, as you will see, five points. I'm asking for five requests, five different requests, five specific requests for you to help me and pray with me and for me for this remaining chapter of my life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Paul says to the young Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all, who have loved his appearing. As I said a few moments ago, I've been here 30 years. I'm not ready to finish yet, but I'm seeing the horizon and the need to cry out to you for sustaining prayer ministry for me in five areas. The five areas are these, please pray for me, Verse 6, 2 Timothy 4, to realize my end, to understand the brevity of life, to be before me evermore, and it's a healthy, good thing to to consider the great need to number my days. Secondly, I want us to please, I want you to please pray for me that I will daily fight the Christian life, fight in the Christian life to the end. Fight the good fight, as we'll see what that means. Thirdly, please pray that I will daily sprint to the end, run with energy this race, this Christian race, of which, again, all of you are going, going to be, you are running with me in this race. And it needs to be a sprint with great energy for Christ. Fourthly, please pray that I will daily persevere to the end and lean at the tape, not run out of gas and not burn out or fizzle out or disqualify myself out as I've sadly known too many ministers a number of them friends of mine who fizzled out pray that I would persevere to the end and then also number five please pray that I will daily embrace my end Paul says in numerous places there's five different crowns that believers are going to receive on the great day of judgment and in this particular case it's the crown of righteousness to everyone who loves his appearing, who's looking for the coming of Christ, ready to proclaim his name.
five prayer requests. Let's pray before we hop into this now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for the scriptures that are a sure guide to heaven for each of us. They're reminding us not just of the importance of hearing a word from you, but reminding us of the sobriety of it all and being mindful of the request that all Christians here today should desire these prayers as well. All of us are, should realize our end. All of us should fight to the end. All of us should sprint to the end. All of us should persevere to the end. All of us should embrace our end and aim to finish well and, and continually request prayer, sustaining prayer to help us walk in the way we should go for the glory of your name. Lord, encourage us now from your word. Thank you for how you've humbled me and, and challenged me as I look into this next chapter of my life. And I pray, Lord, that it will be lengthy, at your will, energetic service, focused on you, and fruitful by your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul told the Thessalonians, or asked the Thessalonians for this prayer ministry in two areas. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 and 25 kind of will help us get our thinking straight. In other words, Paul is requesting prayer. He says, pray without ceasing. And it's, a, it's prayer for him that, that includes because he says in verse 25, brothers, pray for us. Paul depended upon prayer. Paul didn't assume because he had gone to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 and it reminded us that he saw things that he couldn't even utter upon earth and that he had seen the living Christ and yet Paul doesn't live off those laurels. Paul is living upon a dependence of prayer seeking first Christ's kingdom and righteousness. A recent passage that I've, been, I've referred to numerous times in recent months is in 2 Corinthians, which again is a great model and a reminder, again, of the dependency of Paul and how we all should be requesting prayer, be a praying body of believers, which I believe we are and are growing in that. 2 Corinthians 1.11 says, You also must help us by prayer. Help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. I want to go on in this next segment of my life. I want to go on and be fruitful based on what the prayers of God moving his people bring me to in this next chapter and finishing well. Continuing to ask for prayer. Proclaiming your, the Lord's name. The first point I want us to see then is realize your end. He says this in very simple language, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and as, as the time of my departure has come. Paul had come to the realization that his time had come. He saw from a distance the horizon that his time was winding down. Paul understood that again, that even though his future may be momentary. He's reminding us again of the importance of leaning at the tape. You know, I started looking at different characters in Scripture, and I thought of Enoch, walk with God, God took him, Abraham, faithful to the end, Job, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all faithful men to the end. Then I looked in church history of Athanasius and Augustine, faithful to the end. It's a calling to realize our ends and proclaim the gospel to the end. And Paul likens his, his ministry as a departure, a departure and as a pouring out of his, of a drink, his life as a drink offering. Now notice here, let's lean more into this here. He says this, this drink offering is a metaphor for death. Paul understood his life was a sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's to lay out his life for Christ. 
And thinking in the Old Testament imagery of sacrifices, Paul brings in the, uh, the pouring uh, offering here, which he says I'm, the drink offering is pour, I'm being poured out. It's the conclusion of the sacrifice and poured out over it, refreshing God himself in the picture there and reminding us of the, the time had come for the reality of this libation being offered, pouring out all that he had done for Christ and now finishing this sacrifice of a life for the glory of God. It's a departure, Paul says. Notice he says here, this time of my departure has come. Right before that he says, the time, the time. Think about the, the, the issue of time and the brevity of life. Psalm 139 reminds us here that before we lived one day, God had determined all of the, the, the days that we would live. Psalm 119 says, verse 15, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have saw my, seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. The time, the time, our time, our life is in the hands of God. And so this is a reminder here again of the brevity of life and the reminder that, that before there was one day, all the days that, that we were to live had been ordained. Or how about this one, the salvation, Acts 1.8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the day of your salvation. There's a day of salvation, there's a day of physical birth, and there's a day of our death that's been already projected by God. But we're reminded here of this, Paul says, I, my time is coming. My, the days are winding down, the months, the years, all bringing down to the reality, the realization that my, my ministry is about to end. And this was Paul's final epistle. And in this word in the, in the time, for time, it literally means not, a, not chronological time, but an epoch of time, a punctiliar time. Uh, the time of the day of your death, the, the day of your birth. It's, it's a moment here. And then he uses the word here, again, for time, uh, out of Ecclesiastes, it really is humbling and a blessing. Ecclesiastes 9, watch this, about the reality of us and how much time we, we really understand about our lives. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 12, For a man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of men are snared at an evil time when it is suddenly falls upon them. In other words, everyone here, when it comes down to push the shove, to sit down, relax, think about it, but when we think about it, we know about as much of about our future, beside our salvation and seeing Christ's face, about when we'll die and all that. We know about as much as a bird, think about it, a bird or a fish. Man does not know his time. But we know about as much about our time a bird or a fish. But we know one thing. If we know Jesus Christ, heaven awaits us. If we know Jesus Christ, the reminder for us is no doubt blessing and eternal bliss in the presence of God in the company of righteous men and women made perfect. That's what awaits us there as God's people. But he says, my, my departure, remember, to be absent from the body is to be present to the Lord, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we'll remember it in Philippians 1, 21, for me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We know from Revelation 22, 3 and 4 that Jesus Christ is the reward of heaven, the heaven of heavens. As we see it, the beatific vision, his face awaits us. Think about this for a moment. In an instant, your life could be taken today. What would happen? You would see Christ's face. Be with him forever. 
That's what awaits the people of God with certainty. Not a maybe, not a possibility, but the reality that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what awaits us. And Paul is saying, my departure has come. Paul knew, even though it may not have been in the next week when Paul wrote this epistle, but he knew that that era, that, that period of time was, was winding down like I feel. It says in the Psalm, Psalm 90 that I read earlier, it reminds us 70 of do 80 years. Medicine would tell me that I might live, live another 10 to 20 years. I'm 65 years old. Whatever, the bottom line is, it's in God's hands. Our lives need to go forward trusting Jesus Christ and our departure from this world will either be a departure and then deliverance into the presence of God or in that place of eternal punishment away from the presence of the Lord. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Have you turned from yourself and said, I want to know Jesus Christ. I've repented of my sin. You know, I was being overwhelmed as I was singing the songs a few minutes ago and reminded again of how much these songs, I appreciate Nate selecting these. These are my favorite songs. A couple, a couple more I'd add to the list, but the essence of it is there. But I was overwhelmed with, with the amazement from the grace of God and reminder of the, the beauty of knowing Christ, beholding our God. And the older you get, the more you, you see the reality of the, of the tendency to not want to face that. But the more you mature in Christ, you see the unending presence of God. What a blessing. So this 70 of you, 80 years, Psalm 90, verses 10 11, remind us here again. In other words, my time of departure is near. Whatever nearness means compared to what God says. So here's the questions I have for you. Have you thought much about the brevity of your life? Young people, have you thought much about the brevity of life? Don't presume, because you're young, that life will go on for decades and decades and decades. Are you ready to face Jesus Christ? Are you ready to see the living God? I'm praying for you. This isn't just my requesting that you pray for me. It's, it's in doing so, I'm asking you to, to, to know, I'm telling you, that I'm praying for you. Do you desire to finish well as well? Secondly, not, don't just realize your end. How about this? Fight to the end. Paul says, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have fought it. He's in the, he was in the, in the ring in the fight. Day in, day out, Paul was there persevering, figuratively speaking, fighting against sin, fighting against laziness to study God's word, fighting, again, this whole reminder that of prayer, private prayer life and praying for others and all that, all these things aren't, don't come easy as 5, 1, 2, 3, because we're in a body of death, Paul reminds us in Romans 7, 23, we're reminded again of the reality of the, the clash, the tendency to drift, in our Christian lives. And, and here he's saying, are we in the fight? Are you in the fight? Do you see it as a fight? Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Look at First, first Timothy 6. Similar language. Back up from Second Timothy. First Timothy 6. Verse 12 says, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. Are you taking hold of eternal life? Is that even a thought that crosses your mind? Are you thinking about it? Are you, is it a thought that comes to you? Are you walking in faithfulness and persevering in the Christian life? You know, Again, back to biblical characters. Who do I think of when I think of fighting the good fight of faith? I think of Joshua and Caleb, who I named my oldest son, Joshua Caleb, after. Joshua and Caleb giving the good report in Numbers chapter 14, saying we could, we could take this land, only two out of about 14, 15 witnesses, soldiers went out to 
survey the land. Only two came back with a good report, Joshua and Caleb, Samson, Eli, Samuel, David. These are all biblical characters reminding us again of people who were fighting the good fight. Okay, don't give up. Stay in the fight. Pick up your Bible. Get on your knees. Don't give up. Be faithful to Christ. Seek first his kingdom. Why? Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against all the principalities and powers and, and ungodliness in heavenly places. In fact, William Hendrickson in his commentary said this, it had, it had been a fight against Satan, against the principalities and powers, against the world rulers of the darkness and the heavenlies, against the Jewish and pagan vice and violence, against Judaism, against at, at Galatia, against fanaticism at Thessalonica. The, Paul was in contention with all the problems at Corinth. He's in the battle at Ephesus and Colossae with Gnosticism. He fought the, the, the battle there within his own heart as well. And the list goes on of all the battles. When you fight the good fight of faith, it's doctrinal sometimes. It's for sure spiritual. And again, it reminds us here, we have to be in the fight. Teddy Roosevelt, one of my heroes, I won't read the, the quote, but he said in his book, The Strenuous Life, the, the person who's in the arena is, is really the person who truly lives. In the arena, in the fight. Are you in the fight each day? Or are you just kind of floating in the Christian life? Are you walking with God? It's a good fight. It's, a, it's the right fight. It's a fight we should all be in. Will you finish well? This is just Pastor Marcelino finishing well. I cover your prayers to finish well. It's me praying for you to finish well. Will you finish well? Will you make the decision to walk with God? How needful are you for prayer? Do you see a, a, a great need to request prayer? Do you live upon prayer? Do you believe your prayers could help God's people, as, as we saw from 2 Corinthians 1, 11? I think of the church history figures of Martin Luther. What would have happened if Luther would not have would have given up? What would have happened if Calvin would have given up? A disaster. Just like these other men I already mentioned from the scriptures. What a reminder. What a powerful reminder to us. To don't give up. To finish the fight. Finish the race. That's our next point. To finish the race. Middle part of verse 7. He says, I have finished the race. I have completed this race. My life is winding down. That reminds me of the great text from 1 Corinthians. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians, classic text, where Paul is telling the Corinthians who were a troubled congregation. But notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain? Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run, run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. In other words, what a joke it would be for me to stand up here calling you to run this race with me, and then I myself become disqualified. What a sad, it's not just a joke, it's a, it's a grief. I need your prayers. I need your prayers for God to keep me. I need to, I need to be faithful to walk with Christ. In other words, there's a, there's a race to run and there's a, there's, there's a course to run. Listen, listen, to the, listen to the motif here given to us in Acts 20. And I'll just refer to the other parts of Acts 20, verse 24. Paul is laying everything out here in the gospel at Ephesus amongst the elders. In 24, he says, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So there's Paul talking there, but then elsewhere, I'll just refer you to, in Acts 13, 25, John the Baptist is describing of having a course to run. 
And then our Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 13, 32, he says, I have to run my course. There's, there's a course. Do you, you, you have a course as well. Are you running in the race? Do, do, you have, do you know the course you're supposed to be on to finish strong? Have you even thought in terms of those categories? You should, because not only am I asking you to pray for me, I'm praying for you that you will think this way and think about finishing well, finishing well in your marriage, in your walk with God privately, individually, finishing your career, leaning at the tape, glorifying God, finishing well in serving in Christ's church for the glory of God. You might say, well, okay, we need to finish well. That's, that's great, All right? But what's the, what's the warnings? Anything that's specific? Yes, go with me to Galatians, troubled church as well, problems there. In Galatians 2.2, 2, look at this interesting language where he says in 2.2, 2, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the God, that the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. See, if you're not running in the race properly, you're running in vain. You're flailing. Remember the, the Dave Waddle, the great uh, runner, 800 meter runner. He got away with th throwing his arms run as he was running. It's a bad technique. Okay. We need to not flail and run aimlessly. We need to run with purpose and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter of faith. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray specifically for each other to finish this race. Paul knew when he, had, he was finishing the race, he knew it was winding down. He knew it was in, very close. Soon he would be taken out of the Mamertine prison and beheaded. He knew that his time was up. It was winding down. We're not under that kind of a situation, at least at this point in our nation's life. But are you ready to face persecution because you know Jesus Christ? How about some other people from the Bible? Jehoiada, his example was finishing the race. Elijah, Elisha, Hezekiah, Manasseh. Manasseh didn't, he fell away. Josiah, the king, the young king, who I named my son who read scripture this morning after him. Josiah was faithful. How about people who were faithful in, in our own country's hi history. Jonathan Edwards, faithful to the end. George Whitfield. A lot of people don't know about George Whitfield, but, but not only was he a great evangelist, but, but he was often pelted with dead cats while he was preaching and often had urine poured on his head and faced great death threats. But they would finish the race. They finished it with a testimony. They, they, they needed the prayers of God's people, as I do. How are you praying? I'm praying for you to finish strong. Praying for you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Look at me in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, watch, it says in verse 7, Paul's warning the Galatians. Remember, remember, the Galatians were allowing the Judaizers to say, they were coming in there, the Jew, false Jewish leaders, and saying, you have to not just believe in Jesus, but you have to be circumcised too. And that's, that's adding to the gospel. Paul was battling them, the Galatian heresy. But look, what he, look at the language he uses in verse 7 of chapter 5 of Galatians. You were, there's that word, running well. What hindered you from obeying the truth. See, it's, it's a race we're in. We're, are, you, are you running this race? Or a, are you running it aimlessly? Are you in the fight? Are you, are you desirous of being held accountable and going on to maturity? We're, we're finishing 2023. If God permits, we'll make it to 2024. But what, what are your plans for 2024? You say, well, I'm tired of making resolutions that I don't always keep. You must have a game plan. Repent of your not keeping it before and, and get a line and have a devote, devout commitment to walk with Jesus and finish the race. Say to yourself, I need to finish the race. Fourthly, persevere to the end. Look at the language. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. It reminds me of Psalm 71. Psalm 71. 
I think you're making good time today. Psalm 71. Verse 18. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until, until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Notice here again, there was a, de a deliberateness by the psalmist. Until I proclaim your, your might to another generation. There, there was a game plan. Some of you have gray hair like me. What is your plan? Are you looking at your future? How about your grandchildren? You're going to reach your grandchildren with the gospel? Great grandchildren? What, what are your thoughts? Paul tells Timothy, persevere to the end. He says, I have kept the faith. Now we all know something very important about that. He's giving his explanation. I've kept the faith. That's true. But we know behind the scenes it was Christ who kept him. Now unto him, it says in Jude 24, who was able to keep us from stumbling and present us blameless with great joy at the day of judgment. God keeps us in the faith. He is the one who keeps us walking with Christ. And that thinking, we have to have this mindset or else we end up forgetting who it was that kept us all this time. I remember John Piper, I think it was in, a, it was in maybe Together for the Gospel five or ten years ago. It was when he retired from Bethlehem Baptist Church after 33 years as the pastor. He's since gone on to be a full-time guy there desiring God, but but he, he was talking about how Jude 24 reminded him again that God's kept him all this time, 33 years at Bethlehem Baptist Church. God's kept me these 30 years by God's grace. I know it fully well. It's God, and God's kept you walking with him and us in fellowship one to another. He's the one who keeps us. But Paul says, I have kept the faith. I've kept the faith because God has kept me in the faith. He's kept me there walking with him. Without faith, Hebrews 11, 1 and 11, 6, 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. The faith once delivered to all the saints. It's the, it's the work of God with the people of God. Again, I thought about people in the Old Testament who were some more faithful to the end, who kept the faith. Jeremiah the prophet, Daniel the prophet, Nebuchadnezzar. You say, Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. He, he had, to, he had to eat grass before he acknowledged the living God. Nebuchadnezzar persevered to the end. Simeon, John the Baptist, Stephen. How about from church history? John Bunyan. John Owen, you say, well, what did they face? I mean, Bunyan wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress. John Owen, great theological works. Yeah, well, what we don't realize is in the era they lived, they were in the midst of the great ejection of 1662 in which 2,000 ministers in England were taken out of their pulpits for preaching the word. And they suffered greatly. They were faithful to the end. They kept their faith. They didn't compromise and tried to keep a paycheck. Are you going to finish well? Will you pray for me to finish well? I beg of you. Pray for me to finish well. I want to finish well. I want to glorify God. I need your prayers. Help me with your prayers. Help me. And I want to help you with my prayers. And be faithful in praying for you. Faithful by God's grace. And notice here, these, these figures I just alluded to, they were faithful. They weren't necessarily successful by the world's standard. Our goal isn't success, it's faithfulness. That's the key. Faithfulness to the end. Now, last point, number five. Embrace our end. In other words, he says he'll award, award to me on that great day. Let's go with me real quickly to Acts 24. Acts 24. In Acts 24, 
and have, is, Paul is, is in custody and he's come before Felix and it says in verse 24 of Acts 24 after some days Felix came with his wife Drusilla who was Jewish and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus praise God so Paul has this person brought to him and he's speaking about faith trusting in Christ Jesus beautiful Paul thank you look what it goes on and says and, verse 25, and as he reasoned about righteousness, that's justification by faith, righteousness, imputed righteousness, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he's talking about righteousness. He's talking about faith in Christ, righteousness, and self-control, a godly life, sanctified, walking with Jesus. And, notice, the coming judgment. I remember years ago, Sinclair Ferguson, one of my favorite preachers, Sinclair Ferguson wrote a journal article from a conference that's held every year in London. Errol Holtz had sent it to me. And he said, notice here that, that Ferguson says, hell is rarely ever preached, let alone a series on hell, even mentioned. And not just that, the day of judgment is never preached on. There's coming the great day of judgment. Remember, righteousness, are you saved? Self-control, are you living saved? And the coming judgment, the day of accounting, in which we'll, every one of us will stand, will either stand and be declared blameless with great joy. Go with me to Luke 20, I mean, sorry, Jude 24. A lot of times people portray the day of judgment as a day of kind of a sad day. You get in by the skin of your teeth. I disagree with that. The day of judgment is a great day in which believers have unending joy. What, look at it says, 24, Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. In other words, stumbling so as to never rise again. Apostasy. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless to treat you as if you've never sinned and as if you've always obeyed. He's able to do that, blameless before his presence of his glory with great joy. On the day of judgment, great joy amongst God's people. Why? They're justified by faith alone. The righteousness of God is clothing them by, by mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then they're treated on that day blameless. Who are the church history figures in this segment here on, the, on that great day? Spurgeon, J.C. Ryle, who often spoke of these great truths and who, I believe, are with Jesus right now. But how about these men from the scriptures? Paul, John Mark. Remember, John Mark was seen as, as not useful, but near the end of his life, he became useful to the apostle Paul and faithful, and he had matured. Or how about, how about Peter? Remember Peter? Peter, who denied Christ three times, then he ends up repenting, changing his life by God's grace, and ends up being the author of, of two New Testament epistles. First and second Peter. John the Apostle. How about the thief on the cross? How about our Lord Jesus Christ? The, again, embracing the end. Christ embraced the end of his earthly life to die for a people for his own possession. But there's going to be a great day of a crowning, it says here. Henceforth there is laid up for me, Paul says, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, who gives out the righteous crown, will award to me on that day, the day of judgment, the great day of accounting, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his occurring. Are there any other crowns mentioned in scripture yes not just the crown of righteousness i just mentioned but how about this in first corinthians 9 25 the incorruptible crown or first thessalonians 2 19 the crown of rejoicing or james 1 12 the crown of life or how about first peter 5 4 the crown of glory these are all different crowns all mentioned five different crowns one in our text but again 
it's going to be a great day, a great day of celebration. You say, but I, sometimes I struggle so much in the Christian life, I just don't feel I may even be a Christian. Have you, have you seen your sin and repented of it? You put your faith in Christ alone? For his finished work on the cross? Yes, I, I, I've, I've turned from my sin and put my faith in Christ. Then go walk as God's free man and free woman in Christ. Believe the scriptures. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Believe the scriptures. Go forward in faith, trusting the scriptures. And the day of judgment is going to be a great day of celebration. Blameless with great joy on that great day. One other passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says to the Corinthians, We don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Powerful. Powerful reminder. Powerful. This brings us to our final, final thoughts. Notice it was to all who love Christ appearing. If you know Jesus Christ, then you're looking for Christ, that time of great communion with Christ. Seeing his face. Being with him forevermore. Years ago, Wayne Mack was here at our church. We've had a couple of conferences with him on counseling. And Wayne had been, uh, had become a very close friend of my wife and I, she and Carol. And, and I remember him saying to us at that time, that even though we're 71 years old, we have decided to go spend the rest of our life as missionaries in South Africa. He loved Christ appearing. He's still fighting the good fight of faith. He's still enduring in the race. And it reminds us of the great quote by John Bunyan where he said this, it's not over until we cross the river. Come, crossing that river is coming. And those who know Christ are ready to cross it in the strength that Christ provides. Are you ready to cross the river? Are you justified by free grace? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Turn from yourself and your sins and put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Well, I'm thankful for 30 years with this congregation. I hope God has many more years for me to be here, but it's in his hands, and I, that's where it needs to be. I'm trusting him. I want to be faithful to them. I need your prayers I need them specifically in these five areas and beyond, and I want you to know that I'm praying for you as well. I feel it's part of my calling is to be interceding continually for, with God's people, for God's people. So as I pray for you, please pray for me in those five areas at least, and let us walk together in me. God, give us many more years together for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your great love for us all. Thank you, Lord, for your sovereign grace that comes to those who see their sin, who cry out to you for forgiveness, and put their hope and trust in your finished work. Thank you, Lord, for these reminders. Thank you for Paul, his faithfulness to the end. Thank you, Lord, how you've kept him 
May you keep all those who know and love you. You keep us to the end. Lord, help us be faithful. Help us to be walking in the power and the strength that you provide. Thank you, Lord, for the certainty of eternal life that awaits us. Thank you that you've cast all of our sins into the sea. And now that you're, you're, you've clothed us with your righteousness and you move, you're moving us now to remember your death and to celebrate it as we go now to the supper.